Good evening. Two weeks ago, I set out the progress we as a country have made against our five tests for adjusting the lockdown and the measures we could introduce as a result. And today I want to update you again on those five tests and set out some further changes we can now make. So can I have the first slide, please? Thank you. The five tests are designed, as you know, to ensure that any changes to the lockdown are careful, proportionate and safe. They combine analysis of the latest data on the spread of the disease with assessments of how well we are placed to meet the operational challenges posed by the virus. We must do everything in our power to avoid a second peak of infection that overwhelms the NHS because that would lead to more lives lost, more families in mourning and more disruption to our economy and way of life. Next slide, please. Our first test is to protect the NHS's ability to cope so that we're confident we're able to provide sufficient critical care and specialist treatment right across the UK. And it's thanks to the efforts of those working in the NHS that we can still be confident the NHS can cope. On 7th of June, 443 people were admitted to hospital with coronavirus in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, down from 628 two weeks earlier and down from a peak of 3,431 on the 1st of April. And on the 9th of June, 492 patients with coronavirus were in mechanical ventilation beds in the UK, down from 848 two weeks earlier and down from a peak of 3,301 on the 12th of April. So that means we're still meeting the first test. Uh, as, as, as we are still meeting the first test. Next slide, please. Our second test is to see a sustained and consistent fall in the daily death rates from COVID-19, so we're confident we've moved beyond the peak. And of those who have tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, I'm sad to say that 41,128 have now died. That's an increase of 245 fatalities since yesterday. As measured by a seven-day rolling average, the UK daily death rate now stands at 200, down from 300 two weeks ago, and down from a peak of 943 on the 14th of April. So the death rate has continued to fall, and so the second test is still being met. Next slide, please. Our third test is to receive reliable data from SAGE showing that the rate of infection, the number of people catching COVID, is decreasing to manageable levels across the board. In total, 290,143 people have now tested positive for coronavirus, which is an increase of 1,003 cases since yesterday. The seven-day rolling average of new positive cases found through testing is now 1,419, down from 2,416 two weeks ago, and down from a peak of 5,195 in the first week of May. In a moment, Sir Patrick uh, will talk us through SAGE's latest assessment of the R and other evidence on infection rates. Based on the various data available, the government is satisfied the third test is being met. Next slide, please. Our fourth test is that we must be confident that the range of operational challenges, including on testing capacity and personal protective equipment, are in hand with supply able to meet future demand. Yesterday, 170,379 tests were carried out and posted out, carried out or posted out, I should say, across the UK, uh, compared to around 12,000 at the start of April. The total now stands at 6,042,622. Tomorrow, the Health Secretary will provide an update on how NHS test and trace is performing. 
on PPE. We have secured over 150 deals with new suppliers around the world and procured 2.2 billion items of PPE to be manufactured domestically. Despite the immensely frustrating difficulties we have faced with PPE and testing in the past, uh, this progress means we are now satisfied that the fourth test is being met. Though, of course, uh, we remain vigilant. Next slide, please. Our fifth and final test is that we must be confident that any adjustments to the current measures will not risk a second peak of infections that overwhelms the, the NHS. And I'm grateful to the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer for their advice on the measures I'm about to set out. And on this basis, I can confirm that the government judges we have met the fifth test. Therefore, the government is satisfied that all five tests are met or still being met, and we can proceed with the following further adjustments to the lockdown in England. A month ago, I set out our roadmap to recovery, and that explained the gradual steps we would take to ease the lockdown as the data and the evidence allows. The measures it contained were all conditional, and uh, conditional on continued progress in tackling the virus. We are continuing to follow our roadmap while adjusting our approach as we need to, as we always said we would. Although we are tackling this virus as one United Kingdom, it remains the case that the devolved administrations are responsible for lockdown in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and it's right that they should move at the right pace for them according to their circumstances. And so for that reason, uh, the specific measures I'm about to set out apply in England only. First, on retail, shops. This has been the most challenging period for shops and high streets in our history. Never before have all shops been ordered to shut in this way. It's now been 82 days since we asked these shops to close their doors, and I know the toll this has taken, uh, which is why I am so pleased that, as the Business Secretary confirmed yesterday, we can now allow all shops to reopen from Monday. It's vital that establishments should ensure they're meeting COVID-secure guidelines before they reopen. That way we can keep staff and customers safe while we get retail going. Second, on social contact, I know how difficult the past months have been for people cut off from their friends and family. Last Monday, we relaxed the rules on meeting outdoors so that groups of up to six could gather, provided they are socially distant. We did so in the knowledge that transmission of the virus is much lower outdoors, so we could make this change in a safe way. But there are too many people, still too many people, particularly those who live by themselves, who are lonely and struggling with being unable to see friends and family. So from this weekend, we will allow single adult households, so adults living alone or single parents with children under 18, to form a support bubble, a support bubble with one other household. All those in a support bubble will be able to act as if they live in the same household, meaning they can spend time together inside each other's homes and do not need to stay two metres apart. I want to stress that su support bubbles must be exclusive, meaning you can't switch the household you are in a bubble with or connect with multiple households. And if any member of the support bubble develops symptoms, all members of the bubble will need to follow the normal advice on household isolation. We're making this change to support those who are particularly lonely as a result of lockdown measures. It's a, a targeted intervention to limit the most harmful effects of the current social restrictions. It, it is emphatically not designed for people who don't qualify 
to start meeting inside other people's homes because that remains against the law. Unfortunately, we cannot advise anyone who is shielding to form a support bubble at this stage given their particular vulnerability to the virus. However, I want to say I know how hard it is for those of you who are shielding and we will say more next week about the arrangements that will be in place for you uh, beyond the end of June. Third, on outdoor attractions. Because the risk of transmission is lower outdoors, we can open up some more outdoor attractions for people to enjoy this summer. So from Monday, we will allow outdoor attractions where people can stay in their cars, such as safari parks and drive-in cinemas, uh, to open. I'm very grateful to the zoo industry for their cooperation and forbearance, and I'm happy to confirm that they too can reopen from Monday provided visitor numbers are managed and safeguards put in place. That includes keeping indoor areas such as reptile houses closed and facilitating social distancing. Finally, we will allow places of worship to open for individual prayer this weekend. And I hope that will be of some comfort to those of faith who have been unable to go to their place of worship. As set out in our roadmap, the next set of changes, step three, will not begin until the 4th of July at the earliest, as the evidence allows. I know that these changes are only incremental and that some of you, many of you, may be hoping and waiting for more. I also know that people will once again find uh, anomalies or apparent anomalies in what people can and cannot do. Uh, and as I've said before, I'm afraid that is just inevitable when we're only able to give people a small amount of the freedoms that they usually enjoy. We will continue to remain cautious and measure the effect of the changes uh, that we make. Uh, and as I've always said, we won't hesitate to apply the brakes if that is what the situation requires. And that has meant moving slower than we would have liked in some areas. It's because the rate of infection is not yet quite low enough and because we're not able to change our social distancing advice including uh, smaller class sizes in schools, that we are not proceeding with our ambition to bring back all primary uh, pupils, at least for some weeks, before the summer holidays. Instead, we're working with teachers to bring back as many pupils as we can within those smaller class sizes. We do fully intend to bring back all children back to school uh, in September provided the progress we are making continues, which I hope it will. That is our focus and it is consistent that is uh, with the approach that's been taken by many other countries in Europe. In the meantime, we must stick to our roadmap. I urge everyone to continue to show restraint and respect the rules which are designed to keep us all safe and it's only because of the restraint that everyone you've all shown so far uh, that we're able to move gradually out of this lockdown. So please, to repeat what you've heard so many times before, uh, stay alert, uh, maintain social distancing, keep washing uh, your hands, help control the virus by getting tested if you have symptoms and isolating if you are contacted by NHS Test and Trace. Then we all do that. Together, we'll all save lives and begin to rebuild our country. And I'll now hand over to Sir Patrick uh, for the slides. Thank you very much. It's my first slide. Just a reminder on the R number. The R number describes how many people become infected by one infected person. So when it's three, it means every person is infecting on average three more, and the epidemic grows very quickly. When the R is one, one person infects one other, and the epidemic stays at the same size. And when it's below one, the epidemic is shrinking. 
the way that we calculate the R is different with different diff models, so that the ultimate value that we give from SAGE is the combination and looking at 13 different models went into this particular one. So 13 different groups looking at the R separately, coming up with a consensus value as to where the R, true R, lies. And the view is that the R in the UK at the moment is somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9. So it remains below one, and it remains below one across the UK. That means that the epidemic continues to decrease in size. It's worth just reflecting that it's possible to do this when you amalgamate lots of different models and when you have a lot of data across the whole of a country. It's much more difficult to come up with an accurate value of R when you get down to regional and local levels. And therefore, other numbers become important. It is worth saying that on the data we do have, the R is below 1 in every region. But looking at growth is the other important area. Is the epidemic growing or shrinking? And these growth rates, again, are important to look at, suggesting that the epidemic is shrinking in every region. And the third thing to look at is the incidence, the number of new cases, which becomes increasingly important locally and also becomes important when one thinks about outbreaks and clusters, which are important to pick up as the overall numbers come down. And that's an important part of the role of the Joint Biosecurity Centre. So we need to move to different measures as we get to local and regional areas in order to get a proper assessment of what's happening with the epidemic. Next slide, please. This shows some of the numbers from the Office for National Statistics survey from England, where at the moment, over the past two weeks, well, from 17th of May to the 30th of May, this covers, it was estimated that 0.1% of the population had COVID. So that's one in a 1,000 people, meaning that the estimated total number of people in the country with COVID during that period is 53,000. That speaks to the point the Prime Minister has just made, that the numbers are not yet very low. They're low, they're coming down, but they're not yet very low. The second point is how many new cases there are, and here this ONS survey estimates that there are 39,000 new cases every week. That means roughly five or 6,000 per day new cases being picked up somewhere in the UK over that period. These numbers again are lower than they were, they're on the way down, they're not yet very low. In terms of who's already had it, one way you can detect that is through an antibody test to find out who's been exposed to the virus. And here the numbers change across the UK. So in London, it may be 15% or so of people have had it. Across the UK as a whole, it looks like it's around 6 or 7% of people have had it. So if I tie those points together, the R is below 1, but perhaps only just below 1. The epidemic is shrinking, but not fast. <clears throat> Numbers are coming down, but they're not yet very low. And the vast majority of the population remains susceptible to this infection. That urges caution, it urges going slowly with changes, and it urges measuring very carefully to see the impact and being prepared to reverse things where measures have been taken that have an impact on this. And importantly, it also means looking for outbreaks locally and dealing with those fast. Final slide, please. The reason, which is obvious to us all but worth restating that this is important, is that tragically there have been many deaths from this disease. And this shows the ONS data on weekly death registrations over time. So the top line here shows the line for this year. The dotted line shows the line for the previous five years. And what you can see is that on average, there's somewhere between 10 and 15,000 uh, deaths per week. And you can see the very clear peak that started at the end of March and has now come down almost back to baseline, which is entirely due to the effects that COVID has had, both direct and indirect in terms of the other effects across society. And you can see here the peak and the fact that it's coming down. And unfortunately, this has not affected everybody equally. So we know the elderly have been particularly susceptible. 
We know that those with other diseases have been uh, particularly susceptible. And we know, of course, tragically, that the BME community have been particularly affected by this. This curve reminds us why it's so important to carry on doing the basics, hand hygiene, keeping ourselves separated, not going to break the social distancing rules that are in place, and to make sure that we go cautiously, step by step, measure as we go, and are prepared to reverse where it's necessary to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Anything to add to that, Chris? No, in that case, thank you very much, uh, both. Let's go to um, questions from the public first. Ruth in Bournemouth. I am thrilled to see outlets open selling coffee, takeaway food and ice creams, but I'm concerned to see many doing so without wearing gloves and masks. With masks mandatory now in many settings, surely they're essential for those serving food and drinks to the public. How else are we protected from those serving transmitting coronavirus in the unfortunate event they have it and are not at that point aware? Um, well, thank you very much, Ruth. We're, we're of course, as we, as we open up uh, shops and, uh, and other places uh, selling uh, uh, coffee and beverages to, to the public, we're setting out all sorts of guidelines about how to do it in a in a COVID secure way. I mean, the basic guidance on on masks, as you know, is that uh, you should or face coverings. I should say you should wear a face covering uh, when uh, you're likely to be in in close contact with people that you don't uh, normally meet. Uh, I think I'll I'll go to uh, to, to Chris and Patrick really for uh, a comment on. Uh, on, on whether gloves and, uh, and face coverings uh, should be absolutely necessary uh, in all uh, retail uh, contexts. Uh, but we're, we're certainly setting out uh, uh, guidelines for COVID secure venues. Uh, Patrick. Well, face coverings, the sage advice is very clear, and that is that um, face coverings have um, potential benefit in situations where there's indoor spaces where uh, people cannot socially distance, where they are potentially crowded and they will come into contact with multiple people. So that advice has been provided and should form the basis of uh, risk assessment in any workplace to decide what should be done. It's absolutely the case, and you're right, that touching and surface contact is a major form of spreading this disease and therefore other measures, including the wearing of gloves, can be important in certain circumstances. This needs to be a risk-by-risk -risk assessment in, in different workplaces to decide what's appropriate for each individual workplace. And, and businesses that are serving uh, drinks to the public that um, may wish to know exactly uh, when and, and how to wear either face coverings uh, or masks should uh, get onto the website and look at the COVID secure uh, guidelines for uh, for money. Anything to add on that? Chris? The, the only thing to add, uh, I think Patrick has covered uh, face coverings very clearly, is on, on gloves. If someone touches the surface repeatedly without changing gloves, that's actually less good than someone washing their hands between every time they do it. So hand washing, absolutely critical. Gloves uh, can be useful under certain circumstances. Right, Ruth, I hope that's useful. Uh, you know, gloves, uh, face coverings uh, may very well be important, but hand washing uh, remains absolutely uh, critical and can't be stressed too much. Uh, let's go to Alessia in the, in the Lake District. Alessia's uh, question is, will the government's next review of regulations uh, include consideration of those people who have not been able to see their partners and uh, will new guidance include measures which facilitate seeing partners, including staying overnight, which may be necessary for those a long distance away? And, uh, well, I think the answer, uh, the answer to that is uh, if, if you're, you have the option, Alessia, uh, of, of making use of, uh, of you know, the idea of a, of a, of a support bubble, if, you've, if you haven't been able to see uh, the rest of your family for a, for a very long time, uh, I think that that is uh, plainly designed uh, to, uh, to help you. Uh, and, uh, you know, we would want to... Uh, we would want to make sure that uh, people who have been suffering from loneliness have been unable to see their, uh, their families for a long time, the rest of their families, are able uh, to do that. Uh, Chris or Patrick, anything I mean, just, just to add? Just to, because this is a new thing, just to be clear what, what can be done and what can't, uh, the idea of the bubbles is for families which have a single adult in the household. So if this applied to two 
families with a single adult in the household, uh, that would be covered by what the Prime Minister has just talked about, this idea of bubbling. Uh, for other people, it's largely going to have to be around meeting outside, and that's the, the key is uh, outside and socially distanced because the risk of transmission is much lower. To go back to the reason why we're doing this, because everybody can see exactly why this question is so important, why it is so important for people who want to see their families and their partners. It is only by breaking the links between households uh, where things could be transmitted that we can continue to keep the R down as we take forward these slow, steady steps forward. Uh, and the reason for making the bubbling relatively specific is that reduces the risk that you're joining together several households. So the bubbling is about single households or uh, lone parents. Uh, uh, at least one of the people will be in that category, and then there's a meeting outside for other people. I think Alessia's just just to try because I think Alessia's question is also people will want to know, uh, you know, if they're, if they're in a single household, they can elect to to be in a support bubble with a with a, with another household. But she asks about staying overnight uh, a long distance away. How 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 we 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 don't generally want to encourage households mingling, but what's what's your reaction to that? So the what what the suggestion about bubbling is that this will allow people who belong to a single household or lone parents uh, to stay if uh, necessary, but this doesn't apply except in that situation. And the reason for that is single, single uh, households uh, will have many fewer contacts and therefore it's linking up many fewer households. Okay, well, I hope that's helpful, uh, Alessia. Uh, the answer is uh, we, we're going ahead now uh, from, uh, I think, from the... From the, from Saturday, from the 13th, we're going ahead with the, uh, the support bubbles, uh, and you, you've heard what uh, Chris has said. This is, this is intended for single households uh, where there's been particular loneliness and, and isolation, and they have the opportunity now to, to form a support bubble uh, with another household and, uh, and to stay overnight where necessary. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, let's go to questions from, uh, from journalists. Uh, let's go to Laura Koonsberg of the BBC. Um, thank you very much, Prime Minister. How, as Prime Minister, have you allowed a situation to arise where a child can go and look at lions at the zoo, a single relative will now be able to go and have Sunday dinner with their family, but in many situations that same child might not be able to go back to school until September? And if I can ask a question to you all, including Sir Patrick and Professor Whitty, Neil Ferguson, one of the other scientists who was advising the government on lockdown, told MPs this afternoon if it had been introduced a week earlier, we would have reduced the final death toll by at least a half. Is he right? Um, Laura, can I just quick, quickly go uh, first to, to schools? And uh, yes, of course, uh, as I said earlier on, we would, uh, we would like to be in a position where we could have got those, uh, the remainder of primary uh, back for uh, a couple of weeks before the, the summer holidays. We, uh, we wanted to, to do that if that was going to be possible because of, of what uh, of Patrick and the point Patrick and Chris have been making about the continued prevalence of the disease. I mean, 53,000 uh, have it right now. There are uh, 30,000, 39,000 new uh, cases a, 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 a week. Uh, clearly, we've got it right down, but it's not quite down far enough to change the, the social distancing measures that we have in, in our schools. So what we'll be doing is a huge amount of uh, catch-up uh, for uh, pupils over the, the summer months and uh, the Secretary of State for Education will be announcing, Gavin Williamson will be setting out a lot more uh, next week about the, about the catch-up programme. Uh, and I, but I, what I would also point out is that the BBC has very helpfully uh, put, provided a, a, a guide to what other European countries are, are doing. And you, you can see that actually, you know, in uh, Italy, Ireland, uh, all schools remain shut until uh, September. Spain, uh, no primary uh, schools uh, going back, or very few uh, primary kids are going back. France and, and Germany, only partial openings. We're very much in line or, uh, or actually slightly ahead of some other uh, European countries in what we're doing. We're, we're, you know, we're taking a more cautious approach uh, than some, uh, uh, but uh, slightly ahead of others, and I think that's the right place to be. Uh, um, I answer yes, sorry, on the, on the second question, I'm really going to uh, ask uh, the members of SAGE to, to comment. 
uh, Neil Ferguson was obviously a, a member of SAGE, and, and uh, um, his, I think he went on after that initial comment to say, now's not the time to second guess. And I think the, uh, the general point is, should we go back and look at carefully at the phasing of the measures, the different groups of measures, which ones made the biggest impact? Can we see in retrospect which ones are most important? Uh, that's going to be important for f judging the future, should this happen again in the winter. And um, there's time to go back and do all of that analysis, and we absolutely should go back and look. It's very important to understand, very important to shape whatever it is we do in the future. So I think those are important scientific questions to address, and um, they haven't yet been fully addressed. I mean, I completely obviously agree with Patrick. I mean, we both come from a trade where looking back and working out what you would have done knowing what you now know is absolutely routine and it's how you improve on what you do. But I think if we, uh, I mean, just on Professor Ferguson's point, I mean, I think a variety of different people are going to come with different answers on the timings question. Actually, we're not going to get an identical situation <clears throat> to what we had then, not least because we actually know a lot more and we'll have a lot more information. Part of the problem we had at that stage was that we had very limited information about this virus. There's still a lot we don't know, but we know a lot more now. But what I think is much more in critical for we do need to start looking at, even at this point, uh, is what is the best combinations of measures that have the biggest impact on reducing the virus, but have the, the least impact on society for that effect. And there's clearly a very complicated balancing act. And that's partly for allowing us to, lock, to release the various lockdown measures in a, in a sensible, measured steady way as the prime minister was laying out but we have to take that very very carefully but we also have to accept that uh, we could find ourselves in one of three situations uh, one is where the uh, virus uh, we actually have a situation where it starts to escape control and that the aim for going very slowly is to prevent that from happening but that's a risk and we need to know which ones to reintroduce there the second situation is we all think there is a reasonable chance that in the winter this virus will have some advantages it doesn't have at the rest of the year. It's something which transmits more easily indoors, for example, and therefore things that are working well in summer and autumn may cease to be working as well in winter and we need to know what combination of additional things we might have to uh, introduce or reintroduce at that stage to cover a difficult period of the year and then finally the nature of new epidemics is very often they come in waves circling around the world and if we get hit by another wave at that point we need to understand better what is the optimal mix of things we can do so i think there is a lot we should be doing even at this stage to work out optimum mixes of things timings strike me as something which um is important. We're learning more the whole time. We'll give a better answer to that the whole time. But that, to some extent, doesn't really help us for the future to the same extent. Thanks very much. And um, I just want to repeat, I should have made it absolutely clear uh, in, at the beginning, I hope I did, that we fully intend to get all schools, all pupils back uh, by uh, September if, as I say, the science and the uh, our, our battle against the disease uh, allows it, which I very much hope uh, they will. But in the meantime, I want to thank uh, teachers uh, very much for all they've done to keep so many schools open uh, throughout the crisis. Thank uh, parents and, uh, and, and pupils. It, it was never going to be easy to, to restart all of uh, primary schools in the way that uh, we have, but we've got uh, substantial numbers now going back into uh, some of these years, uh, year six in, in particular. It's growing every day, uh, and so thank you very much. We'll continue to make uh, make progress on that. Can we go to... to Prime to Minister, can I just ask you Dan, to... Can I, just, I think we're not going to have follow-ups with, with great uh, respect. We haven't, I haven't given follow-ups before, but do you, are you, you desperate for a follow-up? Go on. I think you need to unmute Laura. Well, yeah, I just could you address that point made by Professor Ferguson? Uh, well, yes, I, I, I really have nothing to, to add to the, um, to the, the views of the uh, members of, of SAGE. I think that, uh, uh, you know, we'll have to, all, the, all such judgments, I think, are, uh, are, will need to be examined uh, in the fullness of time. And, and I, as uh, Professor Ferguson was a member of, uh, of Sage, I think, at the time, as he as he readily as he readily accepts. Um, uh, Dan Hewitt of ITV. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, firstly, on, on schools, um, the Tory chair of the 
education select committee is asking you personally to intervene to take charge of the situation with schools you had a big plan for the economy with the furlough scheme you had a big plan for the nhs with nightingale hospitals where is the big plan with education and getting children back to school in september if i may follow up on on laura's uh, question regarding professor ferguson he also uh, said today uh, that uh, uh, britain missed 90 percent of its coronavirus cases because we weren't screening passengers at airports. Uh, question to all three of you, are there no measures at all that you look back on, even now, months ahead, months on, that you think actually, yeah, we did get that wrong, we could have introduced that earlier? Do you not ever think about those, those big measures you put in place? Um, well, Dan, let me just go first on, on uh, schools and say that we do have a very big plan to get uh, all our uh, pupils, all uh, pupils back to school uh, by September. We've started uh, getting primary back uh, already, as you know, from uh, from the 1st of, of June. Uh, the numbers are climbing every day and, uh, you know, we, some people who uh, only last week were saying we were it, we were being reckless in going too fast and now saying uh, that we're going too slow. Uh, we think we're taking the, 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 the right decisions at the right time uh, to beat the virus. And, and by the way, uh, that point really goes for, uh, for your, your second uh, question as well. I think that we'll have to wait and and see what the uh, what the evidence really says. So I think you know Chris and Patrick I might want to come back on it, but uh, th there are a lot of questions, uh, as Patrick said, that are still unanswered. I want to come back on it reasonably clearly. It's not a matter of do we ever look back. We always look back. That is the whole point of having a scientific and medical method, is you look back and you say, what could we have done better and what can we do for the future? So we absolutely should. There's always a question of timing and there's always a question of what do you do now, even in the middle of something, and be very clear, we are not at the end of this epidemic, not by a long shot. We're in the middle of it. And what do we actually wait till all the data comes in and we look back and say, these are the right things to do? So it's a fair question, but I want us to be very clear. Uh, all of us would say, absolutely necessary to look back and learn what you do better. Any emergency post-review, post-emergency review is critical. Everyone, everyone would accept that, I think. Just one other thing to add to that. That data came actually not from Neil Ferguson. It came from a, a group um, looking at the genomics of this that we funded very early on in this for exactly this reason, to find out what was going right, what was going wrong. And we knew we wouldn't get the answer till later, but it's an important part of what Chris has just said, to always be prepared to get the data, to look back and find out what was right, what was wrong, and what we know in retrospect. And that's an important part of the scientific method. Thanks very much, uh, both. Uh, Beth Rigby from Sky. Thank you. Sweden's top epidemiologist said last week his COVID-19 strategy had resulted in too many deaths after he persuaded his country to avoid a strict lockdown. Today, Professor Ferguson said going into lockdown a week too late cost an estimated 25,000 lives or more. So the same question, please, to all three of you. What is your biggest regret? And what do you now wish you'd done differently? Well, Beth, I really, I really can't go further than the answer that, uh, that I've already given. And I, I, you know, I'd ask Chris and Patrick to, to comment on, on, on that. Of course, you know, we're going to have to look back at all of it and learn the lessons that we can. But frankly, I think that uh, a lot of these questions are, are still premature and there are lots of things, lots of data, lots of uh, things that we still don't know. And this epidemic has a, has a long way to go, alas, uh, not, in this, not just in this country, but around the world. The, the only thing I'd, I'd add to that is, you know, we need to get the information to find the answer to that question. It's an important question. Will we have got everything right? No, for sure we wouldn't. There are some things that we will have got wrong and we need to make sure that we understand what they are, learn from them, and get them right next time. And that's exactly what we need to do. And we shouldn't be just guessing as to what those things are now. And it's a very complicated situation. We have much more information now than we had then, and we need to learn from it and make sure that we use that to get the next stages of this as effective as they can be. I mean, Chris, do you want to add anything? Uh, I mean, I think there's a long list, actually, of things which we need to look at very seriously. If I was to choose one, it would probably be choose uh, looking at uh, how we could do speed up testing mm. very early on in the epidemic. 
And many of the problems that we had came because we were unable to actually work out exactly where we were and we're, we're trying to sort of see our way through the fog rather, rather more with, more with more difficulty. There are many good reasons why it was tricky, but I think if I was to play things again, and this is largely based on what some other countries were able to do, particularly Germany, I think I've said this before, uh, I think that's the one thing that uh, we would probably have put more emphasis on at an earlier stage. There are many others, but I want to, I'll, I'll highlight that one. Thanks. Minister, Thanks very much. I have a quick Beth. follow up there, please. No, may I have a quick follow up? Yes, I gave Do you one not Laura. regret not going into lockdown earlier? Is that not a regret of yours, given what you know now? Well, uh, Beth, I'm really going to have to go back to what Chris and Patrick uh, have you, said you make because the I think. And, and, and uh, you know, we we made the decisions at the time on the guidance of Sage, including. Uh, Professor Ferguson that we thought were right for this uh, for this country and I think that the um, you know the questions uh, that are posed are still unanswered and there's a lot of data that we still uh, frankly do not have and I, I think it would be you know I, I know you want me to, uh, to to cast judgment on now on everything that happened in the uh, in the months that have gone by I just think that that, ex that of course that moment will come and of course we've got to uh, to learn lessons, but I, I, you know, I just think that it is at at this stage premature. There's still too much that we don't know. Thanks very much, Beth. Let's go to Gordon Rayner of the of the Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, on schools, um, you've said that your intention is to get all children uh, back in school by September. Um, the problem at the moment, as you've said, is that uh, you can only have class sizes of fifteen. Uh, so it seems that the only way that you can get those children back is to either increase the size of the school estate uh, so you have more room uh, or relax the two metre rule uh, in order to achieve that. So which is it going to be? Um, thanks, Gordon. Well, of course, the, in primary schools, the, the two metre rule is, is not the issue. It's the, it's the class sizes that are uh, the question, but both really um, affect the size of the, of the school estate in question and whether you can get all... Uh, all, all the pupils back. The, the problem is, as I've said earlier on, that the, uh, the level of the epidemic, though it is way, way down, is not down as low as, uh, as we would like uh, in order to relax the social distancing measures in, uh, in schools. So uh, we're going to get all schools back uh, in September. Uh, as I say, if we possibly can get all schools back in September, uh, but it's going to be a big summer of catch-up, and not just a summer of catch-up, I should say. Um, uh, Gordon, it's going to be, we're going to keep making sure that uh, kids uh, get the, uh, the remedial help that they need for the stuff that they've missed uh, for months and months to come uh, so that they, they genuinely make up for, for lost time. So we want to have a, you know, a educational catch up and an economic bounce back at the same time. Can, can, I, just, can I just ask you a quick follow up, Prime Minister? Um, the, the, the two metre rule obviously is, is what's stopping pubs, restaurants and lots of other things from reopening. And so do you do you agree that relaxing the two metre rule is a, is a political decision that's ultimately up to you to take? Um, and are you prepared to go against your scientific advisers if they refuse to budge on two metres? I, I think um, there's a thanks, Gordon. I think there's a balance of risk uh, to be struck. And uh, I think the issue for for me is. Uh, how far down we can get the incidence of disease. I mean, as, as Patrick has just said, uh, we've got uh, only one in a thousand people uh, in this country now uh, with, the, with the virus. However, uh, there are still 53,000 people uh, who have it. The R is only uh, just below uh, one. Uh, we have uh, 30,000 more uh, new cases uh, per week. Uh, it's, not, it's not down as low as I would, as I would like. And I have to be very, very mindful of the risk of new outbreaks. We've, we've made colossal progress in the sense that uh, NHS Test and Trace is able uh, to, uh, you know, uh, isolate uh, local outbreaks. With the, the Joint Biosecurity Centre is, is very, very helpful in enabling us to see what's going on. Uh, we will be able to, to do whack-a-mole uh, with, uh, with new outbreaks uh, with new, in schools or or hospitals, uh, and we already are. Uh, but uh, my judgment at present, my judgment at present is that we must proceed cautiously. 
Uh, I think that, and I think that is shared by the overwhelming majority of the public. They want us to get on, but they want us to get on in a cautious uh, way, and that's what we're we're doing. Um, I mean, well, uh, I may, may, may just add that the, the, the two meters is not a rule. It is not a scientific rule. It is a risk-based assessment on when risk reduces, and the risks are associated with distance. So risk falls after two meters. Time. What mitigating factors you can put in place which include things like whether you're sitting side by side, back to back, or face to face, uh, whether you've got face coverings, whether there's ventilation and other measures, and the absolute risk, i.e. the number of people who've got infection at any one time. And those things which make up the overall risk assessment are what needs to be taken into account, both in terms of policy decisions and operationalization of this in different business environments. And so wrong to portray this as a scientific rule that says it is two metres or nothing. That's not what the advice has been and it's not what the advice is now. And a series of um, measures explaining under what conditions the risk may differ with different distances, time, mitigating factors and the absolute risk. Thanks very much. Uh, Pippa Creera, Daily Mirror. Good afternoon. Um, Prime Minister, you've said that schools aren't yet fully back because the rate of infection isn't quite low enough. So were the teaching unions right to express caution? And why hasn't education been more of a priority when it's so integral to what you say is your core aim of levelling up the British economy? And can I quickly ask the scientists as well, please? Um, the Prime Minister set out how the five tests have been met. But in the plan to rebuild document that he referred to on May the 11th, um, it said that the changes to the lockdown, and I quote, must be warranted by the current alert level, which I think is still at four, but maybe you can clarify that. Are you both completely comfortable about the pace at which we're easing the lockdown? Thank you. Pippa, just obviously, uh, schools are safe to, uh, to go back to. They're safe for your uh, children. That's a very, very important point. But uh, we need to have, in those schools, we need to have certain measures at the present time, which are dictated uh, by the the, the state of the pandemic in this in this country and uh, so it's smaller class sizes uh, or, or the two meter rule and those obviously dictate the physical configuration of the school and make it difficult to to open up uh, all primary uh, schools at once for all all pupils and and I, and I think people get that uh, but we are going to go ahead uh, in September if we possibly can opening up all schools opening up all schools from uh, from September so you've got uh, a lot of primary coming back now, uh, years 10 and 12, uh, getting uh, face time with their teachers uh, from, from Monday. Uh, that will go ahead so they can prepare for their exams next year. And a huge amount of catch-up work so that uh, pupils get help uh, during the summer and the autumn and beyond so that they get the education they need and deserve. And that is, that is our, our objective. And uh, we, we, I see massive uh, importance in this uh, campaign, not just for, uh, you know, for, for, for economic purposes, treating the schools as, uh, you know, because we need to educate the next generation, but for, for simple social justice. Because uh, after all, uh, so many pupils uh, who have not been getting education in school uh, have not had quite the, 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 the homeschooling that perhaps others have had. And it's vital that we, we compensate as fast and as far as, as we can. And, and that is what we're going to do. So why hasn't it been more of a priority then, education, when you compare it to well, um, the health and economy, it's, it's, for example? It's been a massive... No, no, I, I totally reject... I mean, I respectfully, uh, Pippa, reject that. And I, and I, and I, I draw your attention, uh, if I may, to uh, the very helpful compilation by the BBC of what other countries are, are doing. And you, you'll see that, you know, there are plenty of countries uh, in, uh, are, are on, in, in other EU countries which are, are, are not actually uh, getting primary schools back at all. Uh, so, uh, or until until September. So, you know, we're going as fast as we can. We've we've still got a pandemic to cope with. We'll get all schools back in September uh, if we possibly can, and we're going to have a massive catch-up operation uh, over the summer and, and beyond, which Gavin Williamson uh, will be uh, will be setting out next week. Should I go on the um, the second one? Yes, please. There are no comfortable options. And anyone who pretends there is a comfortable option has not understood the situation we are in. 
So I think of this as a, every, every doctor, as every healthcare professional would, it's always about balance of risk on all things that you have to uh, deal. You know, giving a drug, there are side effects. Doing an operation, uh, there are side effects. You have to take a risk because that's the best thing to do at the time. We're obviously having, in government, to balance a large number of risks. All of society is having to balance a large number of risks. But what you're trying to do is manage those risks as best we can uh, with the information we have to minimise the risk of a bad outcome and to maximise the, the possibility of a good outcome. But the idea that there is some option which is completely safe and it's all fine is clearly not true. And I don't believe anyone listening to this thinks that that is an option. So what we think is that this is a reasonable, provided people hear what the Prime Minister is saying and stick to what the Prime Minister is saying and don't try and extend it out. And the people who are opening businesses stick to the COVID secure rules and people that are reasonable in the way they do it, our view is this is a reasonable, balanced, sensible way to go at this point in time, accepting there is always a possibility, as Sir Patrick and the Prime Minister have said, that if things start to go up for, for no, when, when you're under a number of reasons, we might have to go back a couple of paces. But this seems a reasonable way to go at this particular point in time, but not a risk-free one. And there are no risk-free options ahead of us. And it's very important that we get test, trace and isolate really working as part of this. That has to be part of this. That's absolutely right. Thank you. Um, Maria Zaccaro from the Southern Daily Echo. Thank you, Prime Minister. 600 people from Southampton have been asked to volunteer for a coronavirus vaccine trial. What would you like to say to them? And secondly, the pandemic has basically shut down the main industry in the city, the cruise industry. Hundreds of jobs are at risk and people fear for their future. What will you be doing to ensure the cruise industry is safe? Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Uh, we, we, like all industries, the, the cruise industry, I think, is going to have to go through, uh, uh, in the short term at least, a period of, uh, of self-reinvention to, to make sure that it is COVID uh, secure. And I've no doubt that it, it can do it. It's a great, great British industry. We will support it in any way uh, that, we, that we can. And on the, um, the coronavirus trial, the 600 patients in Southampton, I'd just like to thank them very much. Uh, for what they're doing. I don't know who, which, which uh, vaccine they're, they're trialling, but uh, uh, Patrick's the expert on, on vaccines. Well, um, my message is the same, which is thank you very much, because uh, the way that vaccines are going to come through this is obviously through clinical trials now. They've got to get into clinical trials. We've got to find out what works, what doesn't, what side effects there are, which ones are tolerated, which ones are not tolerated, which ones produce a big immune response. And so the way to do that is volunteers. And every time that somebody volunteers for a trial, that is them being selfless for the rest of society. And so a big thank you from me. And I'll just add, it's not just vaccine. Can I just finish off the answer to the first one? And, uh, it's not just vaccine trials, it's all trials. And actually Southampton has a real record of uh, citizens taking part in trials, in studies, and this is the way medicine progresses, not just for coronavirus, but generally. So an enormous thank you for the whole of uh, what people do to volunteer. Thank you very much, and thanks to Southampton. Listen, a lot of the questions th this evening have been about, you know, what did we get wrong in the past? What do we, what do we say about what we may have, have got wrong in the past? All I can say is at the moment, it, it is it's simply too early to, to judge ourselves. We simply don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. What I can tell you is we know a lot more now uh, than we did in January or February uh, or, or in even March. And one thing we really do know about tackling a coronavirus is you have to proceed uh, with caution and that's what we're doing we're announcing a series of what i hope you will agree are reasonable steps on shops on support bubbles on uh, private prayer uh, on a few other things uh, to begin to uh, tentatively get our uh, society uh, back to normal we will continue uh, with our roadmap uh, we will continue to stick to our plan and in the meantime i hope everybody else all of all, all of you uh, will continue uh, to stick to the advice as well uh, very simple uh, advice uh, follow the guidance wash your hands uh, stay alert uh, control the virus and save lives. Thanks very much.